I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Russell, who I worked with for, I don't know, 35, 40 years. You're not that old. I'm, you're not quite that old, but I, I have worked with him since he came to a, a, the Department of Transportation a number of years ago, started out in the construction world, spent a lot of his construction time uh, working on uh, the Dalton Highway and various locations throughout. He's now the superintendent of the uh, of the highway, uh, responsible for the maintenance. So all the bumps are his fault. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, he he admits that. Um, but Jeff is going to give uh, give us a, a lot of good information uh, about the, the Dalton Highway. He'll be with us the entire uh, length of the, of the Hall Road, showing us some of the features, some of the areas that they're struggling with. Uh, so I'm sure you'd be happy to take input uh, how he might be able to, to help on that. Uh, so with that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, as I was kind of putting this together, one of the things that kind of, I don't know, coming back to some of me and Billy's conversation when I first started, um, water, is the number one enemy of, of any road system, right? So we're always trying to figure out how to transport it through it, how to manage it when it when it saturates. Um, my first four slides are gonna probably deal with uh, one of the events that probably is still up and foremost because it has affected almost all of our designs uh, going forward. In 2015, the uh, Sac River, um, which has always off ice, uh, had decided to uh, migrate over towards the uh, road system. At the time, there were various places on that road where um, the, the surrounding ground, I always call it OG, just a construction term for original ground, was probably higher than the road itself. And so when the road, so when the water came, uh, there was no natural barrier and it came across. So I'm sure there's somebody can give me, can enlighten me, but when I went to school, they told me water froze at 32 degrees, or zero, zero Celsius. Um, when this was taken, it was 20 below outside. Um, and I think I got, now how do you advance this? It's right there? Yep. So, what first happened, that started, it moved to uh, very specific areas. Uh, Alyeska, when they had done a lot of their uh, work, if you look, they put uh, barbs, in stream barbs for flooding events along those areas where the pipe was buried. So if you were if you were go out and you could see those barbs, those did an amazing job encapsulating water. And then since the road was, since those barbs were at the same elevation as the road, they just moved them across. Um, this was me uh, because I didn't believe it. So I took, I took cameras and I took a lot of pictures. I went back and review for this. I think I took over 3000 uh, just because of the, you know, the whole thing. Nice. If you want, I saw the other hat I wear is ice engineering hat, and I can kind of explain that. But, um, the one thing that you have to have is super cool water, right? It has to be below freezing. Right. And then there has to be something that starts to nucleate in there. And when it's moving that quickly, and I assume through through that event, the water was moving pretty quickly, um, you just don't have the ability to develop frazzleized mm -hmm. is what starts to accumulate and increase your ice sheet. Yep. So you just you probably just had two turbid of water probably downstream and started to quiet out and then it was frozen downstream where it flooded yep. out could be my guess. Yeah and, and off ice is a, I mean and you just described off ice. I mean you know one of the things you know my construction experience you know water under pressure or the flowing will not freeze. Is, I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the simple, you know, simpleton, we're, we're going to go simpleton every time. And so that was, and, and yes, you're correct. And, and if, and, you know, we're used to seeing off ice um, on all of our contributaries and rivers along the, the, the Dalton Highway. 
Um, and most of our design features accommodate that. So, a couple of things. Um, so the only really accurate records that we're going to have are, are from Aliesta, right? They're the ones that had monitored it. They're the ones that had done quite a bit of work with regards to uh, the Sag River and its flow capacity. Uh, they only had one monitor, which was by pump two. Um, but there was absolutely no record of water off ice encroaching to the road until 2015. Well, we had a very small event in 2014 uh, during spring breakup, but I wouldn't have contributed that to off ice, um, which obviously 2015, and then we had uh, another event in 2016. So, you know, crews called, you know, it's in the middle of winter. I, I'm not going to get gravel to berm up, you know, as a protective, you know, for the road. So literally, we really built snow with the hopes that the ice would freeze, and then that we would use that as our barrier. Okay, I mean, next, yeah, go ahead. So one of the things that started happening was then it became the bathtub effect, right? So any water that breached. Um, you know, through all efforts, let's just face it, water's not going to, we're not going to stop it. So, so this is, you know, I don't know if we can, we can do this, but basically what we did is we kind of created a, um, yeah, go ahead and hit the play. But basically, right. So as we were trying to build barriers, Basically, then we just figured out how to make a bathtub, and that was the biggest issue we ran into. What I will say um, to your point was water would eventually freeze um, when we went uh, through the spring of 2015. Um, the water had changed the elevation of the road uh, six feet to 10 feet, depending on location and entrapment of the water that we had had. So that was, you know, so there was, you know, I mean, obviously um, resources were limited. Um, we did not have, a, a, I mean, we were obviously given the open checkbook concept. Go ahead and hit the next slide, please. Next slide, I'm sorry. Um, but you can see through just what that, that ice layer was showing, all we were really doing was we, what we did was we stopped trying to stop the water and just started building over the top of it. And that's why we got some of the elevation changes that we were just talking about. Um, the road did close uh, when the first event hit. We were able to keep the road open uh, through traffic control, but come springtime, um, the water breakup event took out the road and we, so we were, uh, it closed Dalton Highway for 29 days. Uh, again, you know, you know, we had limited resources, but we had plenty of money. Hit one more time, and so there were several avenues that we took. I, I chose this picture um, just, to, but and what we had found was we'd gone back and done some of the satellite surveys, and we were able to determine what areas uh, the off ice was being generated from the underground streams. Uh, there were two things that we had discovered through that process. One of the biggest ones that we had uh, found out was, um, so there are several projects that go across this river that they build ice roads. Uh, and those ice formations had grounded, meaning that there was, an, and that's not uncommon. That's if you were to look, I mean, that's most of the reason why you'll see uh, water flow in the middle of winter is the ice is grounded. Water is looking for a place. It's on it's, it has a frozen some pressure on the flow. It will then come up to the top, and that's you know that was kind of what was happening here, but it was happening on a grander scale, and it was moving west, which it had normally never done. So uh, they had uh, in 2015 they had 26 excavators basically rechannelizing whatever flow that they could find and trying to get it to move back towards the east, which would be Franklin Bluffs, which you folks see on, on the east side of the Sac River. In 2016, uh, we refined that technique 
we were able to identify one of the major contributors. And what we did was we just took that, developed a trench to cut off with all of those. We were able to do the same effort successfully without closing the road um, with three excavators and, you know, and just you know, a very detailed plan of how we were going to cut off the off icing and how we were going to channelize the flow through these. Uh, interestingly enough, that the only picture that I can't find was we literally flooded the whole east side of Franklin Bluffs out through that area. Nobody complained, so <laughs> I'm going to call it a success, <laughs> which is kind of how I'm not for most of my activities now. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so I kind of wanted to talk about which is one of, one of our actually next most common problem uh, issues that we deal with regularly, and you will see evidence of it. Um, this year has been unique. We haven't seen it anywhere near what we normally saw. Uh, but if you're a look, these are um, water flows that are coming, and this is the one I was trying to show. Uh, this one in particular is on the Elliott. Um, this off icing will, and they, they, they developed a 30 foot flat bottom ditch. It will take out, it will literally overflow the road. Um, we'll have to go through during, period, uh, during periods of winter, but we'll have to go back, cut that ice back. And then we try to try to rechannelize that uh, that ice go down road, which unfortunately is the entrance to uh, Mental Road to Mental Village, and so we'll flood out that road, which then creates other fun, interesting things that we do. And probably I'm not I don't know how many environmentalists are here. <laughs> <laughs> probably not going to. Um, but that, that will, I will tell you any, any back cut, any back cut will at some point reach water to some form, to some degree. And if we do not have the drainage to address it, we will deal with it in some form or fashion. Um, normally we'll go in there with, we can take, uh, we have boiler trucks. We can just take that steam, keep the line hot. And we'll just channelize, we'll just cut in trenches, uh, take that off ice to the lowest point, um, where usually is a creek and a very, you know, has a large dispersion area for, for the off ice. And that usually does the trick. This one's unique um, when it does flow, uh, even with a 30 foot flat, flat bottom ditch, um, the capacity is just not there. Uh, but um, over the years, I think they built that road uh, five years ago. They completed this cut five years ago. And we hadn't seen the first three years we were out there with equipment starting in December. Um, in the last two to three years, uh, we haven't had to address any issues. Uh, the design has worked. So this is the most recent event. Um, and this was, well, they just finished uh, fixing the road. Um, so Sag River uh, off ice created, you know, um, the Sag River is not a very deep river. Um, you know, they, it's, it's shallow, uh, one inch of rain will cause you know flooding event, you know, both top of Sphinx typically in various locations. Uh, but in this case, um, when water started flowing, um, it took whatever easiest path possible. It was just your normal springtime event. However, uh, the water did choose right here. This is a 403 and a half, which is what we'll be seeing. What I was trying to show, and I could not find a video for it, uh, but this section right in here um, had gone in and had undercut underneath the road. And um, I, I've done various projects uh, with construction. 
not necessarily on this section of the road, but it's been true for most sections of the road. It was it was pure ice, uh, specifically right in here. It had cut and had exposed. Um, I believe you know, the construction term used to call it cocktail ice. It was it was pure water, pure ice, which was underneath the road. And that's not uncommon. What else? What in most of my construction experience along this road, what you'll find is it it's usually. Um, an organic mat, frozen material with the embankment on top of it. Um, so I'll come in, the road's probably 30, 40 years old at that point. When I come in and do whatever work we're going to do, we're typically trying to widen the road. When I came on as a superintendent, I would venture to tell you that 50% of the road was uh, 28 foot and probably less in some spots. Um, we're less than 10% of the road now. It's 28 foot. We don't have any areas that are 26 foot. Um, we've had some that were 24 foot. But in that process, you're widening the road, you're introducing a new thaw regime here. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about in this, the, the flood events in 2015, and kind of really through just, uh, you know, well, when I first started out in the industry, I was always taught that if you had five foot of embank embankment, that's when you start to achieve thermal stability. Um, probably 10, 15 years ago, I think you were the first one to kind of describe to me. It's probably closer to 10 feet. Um, yeah. And so this section of road, they built with, uh, they raised grade 10 feet. Um, and I have asked, and when possible, I want to take the road toe of that slope out as far as possible. If your thermal regime is going to be five foot, where you're going to see thermal degradation, it makes absolutely no sense to come in at a one and a half to one, because you're because one and a half to one is the structural regime, regime of your of your road, right? So um, if you want M and O to come in and to because we're a band-aid operation. We're not going to fix any. So if you're looking, if we're looking at a road system and you give me the road, I, if you give me a three to one at 10 foot, I mean, I understand that that's going to be 90 feet out there and that toe slope is. But we know where you're going to see thermal degradation. I mean, I can't think of a, a place on this road where you're not going to see thermal degradation. You're going to see it on the Elliott going into Fairbanks. In space, <laughs> you know what I mean? but, so Jeff, this location in particular, in my experience working on the trenches, which you can see in this photo right adjacent yeah. to the highway, there's about a four mile stretch right here where you have a couple things going on. One is taps. I don't know if you can point it out and with your pointer where it is, but so here's the trenches yeah. and taps. I think it's, it's just right yeah, right there. there. Yeah, so you've got taps running right there and what are taps? Uh, it's Translust Pipeline, it's buried <laughs> in this location. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and so the Translust Pipeline is buried in this location. So you have this hemmed in region right here. Mm -hmm. And the tundra is doing crazy things right here that I have mm -hmm. never seen anywhere else. I don't know why or what it is. I've never seen it before. But I'm guessing this whole four mile region from the end of that pond at the north end there, right back four miles back, is super ice rich tundra. And mm -hmm. it would be really interesting to know if that's actually the case. But the surface of the tundra there, I've, I've never seen anything yeah. like it. It's just falling apart. So, in some of our excavations, some of the other things that we've had to do at various locations before we pay, I can tell you that. When I when I use the term cocktail ice, that's typically what we see. If we if we don't see the organic mat, we'll see gravel on ice, pure, not you know, yeah. silt and infiltrated ice, you know, nothing you know, just pure ice. Um, and there's been there's several pit developments that I've done, and, and we did one at 362. Um, we saw ice, coal seams, gravel, coal seams, ice. So I would tell you that, you know, how are we that at the time and how is it been set? 
And the only reason I can tell you I'm comfortable saying it was coal is when we put it into our ovens, it caught on fire. I haven't seen rocks burn in a long time. <laughs> so, uh, but, and, I, and, and that was one thing I was kind of really hoping to show on this one because that was a surprising thing. But the only advantage that we ever really got to see that was when we started doing uh, our drone surveillance. And I wasn't able to bring up that one. But, but this area right here, very specifically, we got in there and had undercut past uh, center line. And we went back in and looked at it, and you could see that it was exposed to pure ice. Right at, and there were no organic map. What mile is this? That's 403 and a half. Um, I just sent I just a movie out, just by chance. I was driving when you got that. So I, to the yeah. I can load it when I load um, Bill's okay. presentation. I, uh, I don't know if this has a movie for it. I don't think it does. It might have it, but. Sorry, if you go back to that, you were talking about the thermal part of that. Um, sure. You go back to that picture. Yeah, exactly what you were talking about, by like spreading out the slope there. Mm -hmm. That's some work that a colleague of ours, Steve or E, is doing in, in uh, Quebec. Okay. Is, is advocating for stretching out those slopes because exactly what you see right there is snow accumulation. That's that's what's remaining after thaw, right? And especially, I think so. That's that's the uh, the west side of the road, right? Yes. Yeah. So he's that one. This is the river side west of where the snow is. So that they're probably plowing and kicking the snow that direction. Correct. Is that right? Yeah, we, we turned it. You know, well, snow removal is one of those things where it, we don't get it consistent. It's not easterly, westerly. Oh, okay. So, whatever happens. Yeah, yeah. but so that's sure. good. We're going to see it on the other side. The thermal aspect, that's snow right there. It's thawing. Okay. And so, what you're advocating for, those longer slopes, is, is absolutely what's being shown to work. And we already knew that from airfields because airfields are required. They can't have an abrupt bank, but at least the bigger areas, they've got to have a safety margin that goes at a nice slope off and gets their ground. And so you, you see no thaw like that with those. But it's very simple. You know, so if you're having, you're, you're right on the target. And uh, I, I've been arguing, arguing for so many years to do that. Um, in addition to the thermal patches, you have a structural patch. So when you have thermal degradation, the arguing kind of like the shoulder, the shoulder, the Lateral stresses in the foundation cells are about the last foot of the flat slope. And the, the flat slopes themselves, uh, they have that shoulder rotation because everything is more laterally supported uh, versus the steep shoulder. Mm -hmm. And to keep that lateral cracking for the further the mm -hmm. structural program mm -hmm. there. So I think there's a lot of structural advantages to flat slopes mm -hmm. too, yeah. on top of the thermal yeah. advantages. The other thing that more material, yeah, yeah. yeah. more material, more material. I, I was wondering um, about the, the construction material there, where you can see very, it looks like very large rocks. Is that part of the? Yeah, no, no. Of, this is this is the these are the repairs. This is, these are, this is repair. But it's repair. but but typically speaking, everything north of Adigan Pass is going to be very large cobbles. Um, and then built, and then on top of that, it's going to be um, more. Um, yeah, it, it's just made basically what you find is, is very, very large rock. But but this this so I, that wouldn't surprise me to see that within the bottom of the embankment. But this this is the repairs. So that's additional material placed to to prevent the river from further erosion. Is that well? This was reduced, but the river had gotten there. And so this is yeah. our efforts to, you know, you're going to put a, as big as rock as you can, yeah. right, to, you know, for, you know, to, to combat the turbidity. So, so the you prefer during the flood. Yeah, yeah that was during, placed during the flood. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also styrofoam right under the... In Not the, in this section. This um, section is 10 foot. Um, when, they, when they went down to 7 foot, which is at 397 going south, they put uh, four inches or six six inches of insulation to uh, compensate for because I what is it one inch of insulation equals one minute, uh, one foot oh, wow. okay. yeah, I mean that kind of yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I think it's important to know that whenever you're dealing with this I've been hydraulics engineer a number of years ago 
whenever you're trying to restore a, a stream under high flows, you have no choice but use fluoride rock. Yeah. If you put fine rock in there, it goes, yes. it's gone. So you would, we're always going to look for the biggest rock we've got, put that in the bottom, and then try to fill in between the rocks in order to try to hold it up as we build the embankment back up. Um, then a standard practice anywhere you go, I don't care if you're in Montana or Texas or wherever, that's the, the approach you take and really have no choice. I know it's... Um, so, you know, so you'll actually see that we, we have not done any um, repairs to the pavement. Um, we don't have any plans to do any repairs to the pavement. So when we come up on this section, you'll see where the pavement's been compromised. Um, we saved the pavement, I'm just telling you, an undercut to pass in a line, just barely. Um, and that you'll see probably the shoulders and some other, you know, the, you know, the loss of the asphalt. Shall we go on? Any other questions? Yes, yeah, that one. You, you said that there was a pure ice. It's in the ground and just underneath. It was. Ground. It would have been if you were to look at that location right in here specifically. Yeah. It would. It would have been about the elevation of where um, OG, your tundra map, probably was, had resided. Yeah. I, I mean, I would. To your comment, I would. I'm. I'm very comfortable saying that. At least in my experiences, and quite frankly, I was there when they were doing some of that trenching. Uh, it's uh, tundra on ice. Yeah. Um, this section right here, and I was kind of, and I, I was hoping that this was a film, but this right here, it, what what it, what caused uh, the directional flow and the increase in velocities was when the river ran across, it hit this mat. Which you can't see, it came across about like that. It caught compromised and it literally just took, saw it, undercut it. What we saw when this thing started coming in there was exposed ice. So when it cut it, it cut that tundra, it gave a directional flow directly into it. Because if you can see this, this, it, this all kind of came in like this, right? So everything that was, you know, sheet flow. From your uh, from your off ice water springtime event got uh, got focused and increased in velocity directly to the road. It created it literally created a flow right into that section right there. Yeah. Um, but that one of the things I had to kind of laugh was a couple of the MO guys called me up and said, "Dude, you can see the tundra matches were running down the river. I mean, it was just it just tore it up." Um, but that was what, what we saw. Obviously, the water, well, nothing melts ice faster than water. Right? Anyways, yeah, but to your point, yeah. I, I'm, all, <laughs> I'm not from the area, but the, the tundra on the other side, which was probably similar or whatever it is now, mm -hmm. uh, looks like maybe an old drain lake bottom. Is it possible? You're, you're so, it so I when it drain uh, sometimes in the past, yeah, there was some of segregation created uh, this layer of device. Uh, it's, it's actually an ice wedge. Or ice wedge, really. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the reason I pointed out the taxes right there is you also have this hemming in of water in this location between the road and taps. So you've got a lot of water sitting there with no escape. And so then you, I, I think that's probably has promoted ice growth over years in addition to what was there before the road was built. Yeah. I think both it's possible, ice wedges are possible, but uh, also a layer of uh, ice in the intermediate layer. What's that? How many, how much more yeah. do you have? Yeah. About four. Okay, perfect. perfect. Well, so we're, well, gonna, we're gonna let Jeff finish. Uh, we'll go to uh, 10, 15 with questions. Um, then we're gonna have a break for 15 minutes. We'll, uh, we'll have a break for 10 minutes. We'll come back, we'll do introductions, and then we'll do Bill, Bill Strieber's talk at 10, at uh, 1025, 10.30. You guys can really impress how fast I live from this point forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were two things I was trying to show here, and for some reason, the picture really cut it off. 
I, I wanted to show that rotational failure uh, right there, the thermal degradation, one of the reasons and, and, and why we're trying to promote it in, in, its, in its action, this section of the picture. Um, the other part of that is uh, this gravel out of here uh, is remnants from the flood in 2015 where the road got washed. Yeah. Yeah. So, go ahead, next. So this used to be my favorite picture. I used to describe it um, in this manner. And, and I kind of wanted it to be a part of the conversation. Um, the biggest struggle, the biggest component of, of this road in this area is it's not sedimentary. It's not, there, there isn't a homogeneous anything, anywhere. I used to tell people when they got frustrated with what they were dealing with, don't worry about it, it changes in about 500 feet, I guarantee you. <laughs> so this cut was taken by Alyeska when I did this project. This is from 37 to 49, 2004. Now, we'll see this when we go through. This is called Acid Creek right here. We did a fairly major uh, raid on uh, gray areas. Uh, the biggest component of this, I don't know why it tickles me, is we took out six or seven. We did it to, I mean, almost three miles of realignment and took out some pretty hairy curves that I have lots of memories of because the pounds are going down there sometimes. Um, and when we and so when I got the finished product, we used to one of the things that you always do in the project office is you put your project and you tape it on the wall. And our and literally the project went from ceiling to floor. <laughs> and that was the finished product. So you can I mean, even us taking out up here, we took out a, a pretty dangerous curve. What what mile are we at? This is going to be at 39 mile on the Delta Hunt. So what I was trying to show here was that whole concept of things being, you know, uh, nicely, orderly fashion. This layer right here, this green layer kind of comes up, goes down, and it gets to here, and you can't see it in this picture, which is kind of a shame. It starts to go in a circle. This right here is orange, and this was purple, which you'll see when you come up on it. Um, when we went out there and took grab samples of it, it was seashells, um, you know, that kind of, that, those are the kind of things that you kind of got it when you kind of, it was highly fragmented. It had absolutely no strength to it. And you could tell because it failed and, and, it, and it's pushed out, you know, it's, it's taken out the ditch. Um, but purpose I was trying to show in there when we originally took the, when the picture first came and got degraded as much. You can see the colorization of the layers and, and they were distinctly different. There were greens, purples, oranges. And um, obviously, you know, some, you know, and, uh, and had a lot of water, wildlife, fossils, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Right? And, um, and then this cut, and if you follow this rule, if you go up, there's another cut that we did. Um, contractor that we cannot do it anymore because of losing blood on it. Um, it was a good source of rock, but in mining of it just became impossible. Uh, but that's what I discovered. We have uh, these two inch layers of uh, coal seams that run at like about a 45 degree angle. And those uh, are the best transporters of water I've ever seen. Because they'll they'll come in underneath the road, and when we come up on here, you'll see Ice and Creek as we're heading south as we go up the hill. I got to see a D10 track dozer stuck, and three graders trying to pull them up. Um, that's how much water and how it literally just. And and when we go through the project that Cruz is doing now, at 18, 19, 17 mile, I'm not really sure because the, um, those rock trucks that they have with the 10 foot tires, they're going through mud, liquefied, complete mud. It's literally up to the axles on in the rock trucks. Which is, right. and then this is the last one, Good. which I always kind of thought was uh, 
<laughs> That's just hanging out here long enough. To, I actually have pictures of four, but this one happened to be scarred to it. So. 